Yes. The x squared grows faster than the 10x, so the limit goes to infinity. Now let's replace the 10x by 10 to the x. Again, we have infinity minus infinity. What do we get for the limit this time? Let's try plugging in some values and seeing which term dominates. So when x is 0, x squared is also 0, and the minus 10 to the x is 1. So the overall expression, x squared minus 10 to the x, is going to be minus 1. When x is 1, this becomes 1, this becomes minus 10, and we get minus 10. Let's make x a little bigger now. If x is 10, then x squared is 100, and 10 to the x is basically minus infinity. It's huge. So when we subtract them, we end up with minus infinity. Right. The 10 to the x grows faster than the x squared, so the limit goes to minus infinity. In general, infinity minus infinity can be anything. Whenever you see infinity minus infinity, you have to carefully evaluate the limit. You can't just subtract infinities and call it a day. Let's make a note to remind us when this rule doesn't apply. Now let's figure out how to take limits when we're multiplying functions together. Suppose we had to take the limit of f times g, like this, but we knew that f approached 6 and g approached 7. Do we know what f times g approaches? Sure enough, it's 42. Let's write it like this. There's one situation, though, where this rule gets tricky, and that's when you end up trying to multiply 0 by infinity. Let's look at a few situations where f of x goes to infinity and g of x goes to 0 to see what happens. What's the limit as x goes to infinity of x squared times e to the minus x? The x squared term goes to infinity, which tries to make the product really big, but the exponential term goes to 0 which tries to make the product really small. Which one of these two wins? Try plugging in some big values for x into this function to see what happens. Let's try plugging in some large values of x and seeing what comes out. So when x is 10, x squared is 100, and e to the minus x is about 5, 10 to the minus 5, I'm just going to write that as something less than 10 to the minus 4. So what's x squared times e to the minus x? Well, it's something less than 10 to the minus 2. Now let's try putting in 100 for x and seeing what comes out. When we square 100, we're going to get 10 to the 4th. And if we want to do e to the negative 100, the calculator is actually just going to spit out 0 but we know that it's approximately what we got for e to the 10th raised to the 10th power. Remember that e to the minus 100 is equal to e to the minus 10, which we found before, raised to the 10th power. So this is going to be something less than 10 to the minus 40. So when we multiply them together, we're going to get something that's less than 10 to the minus 36, which is really, really small. So it seems pretty clear that if we keep going, we'll end up with something close to zero. Right. The exponential term won that battle and sent the product to zero. By the way, exponentials always go to zero or infinity faster than powers do. So you could say that exponentials always beat powers. Now let's look at the limit of 3 to the x times e to the minus x as x goes to infinity. Again, this appears to be infinity times zero. What does this limit equal? Let's take 3 to the x times e to the minus x and write that as 3 times e to the minus 1, all raised to the x power. Now, 3 times e to the minus 1 is 3 over e, which we can write as 3 over 2.7 something, all raised to the x, and this thing here is approximately equal to 1.1. You can check it with a calculator. So this is about 1.1 something raised to a, the x power. Now when we take a number bigger than 1, we raise it to a very, very big power, 
we're going to get a bigger and bigger answer. So this limit is equal to infinity. This time, infinity times zero went to infinity. It turns out that almost anything can come out when you try to multiply zero and infinity. So you have to think carefully each time. Now we're ready for our last limit rule. Let's think about what happens when we divide functions. The rule here is the same as for previous ones, but now there are a few cases that can cause problems. Let's start by looking at examples where f and g both go to infinity. What's the limit as x goes to infinity of x squared minus 5x plus 6 all over 3x cubed minus 7? The numerator goes to infinity because the x squared becomes the biggest and goes to infinity. And the denominator goes to infinity because of the x cubed term. Which one wins? Let's rewrite this expression up here. It's x squared minus 5x plus 6 over 3x cubed minus 7. One thing that will help with these rational expressions is to divide the top and bottom by the highest power that we see. In that case, it's an x cubed here. So I'm going to divide every single term by an x cubed, the numerator and the denominator. So then our expression becomes 1 over x minus 5 over x squared plus 6 over x cubed divided by 3 minus 7 over x cubed. Now what happens when x goes to infinity? Well, this is going to go to 0, that's going to go to 0, that's going to go to 0, the 3 is going to be left alone, and this term is also going to go to 0. So we're left with 0 over 3. So this limit ends up being 0. Yeah, here the x cubed in the denominator grows faster than the x squared in the numerator, so the entire function goes to 0. What happens if the numerator has the cubic and the denominator has the quadratic? Again, it's infinity over infinity. Let's rewrite the function up here. It's x cubed plus 7. And on the bottom, we have x squared plus 2x plus 10. I'm going to divide through by the highest power of x that I see, which is a 3. So I'm going to divide every single term by x cubed. So my function is now 1 plus 7 over x cubed divided by 1 over x plus 2 over x squared plus 10 over x cubed. Now what happens is x gets really, really big. Well, the 1 stays there, but this goes to 0, and all of these go to 0. 0, 0, and 0. So what we end up with is actually 1 over 0 which approaches infinity. This time the numerator wins and the entire function goes to infinity. So when we see infinity over infinity, we always have to work things out carefully. The limit rule here doesn't work. Now let's take a look at another quotient limit. This time it's x cubed minus 5x over 3x squared. What happens to this as x goes to 0 from the positive side? In other words, what does this function approach as x gets really, really small but stays positive? Well, it looks like 0 divided by 0. What does this limit equal? Let's start by factoring an x out of the numerator. So we're left with the limit as x approaches 0 plus of x times x squared minus 5 on top divided by 3x squared. And bottom. Now we're only concerned with values of x near 0 and a little bit above it, not at 0. So we can divide the top and the bottom by x without changing the value of the limit. This puts the limit as x approaches 0 plus of x squared minus 5 over 3x. 
Now the numerator is going to be close to minus 5, as x is very close to 0. And the denominator is going to be a little bit bigger than 0, as x stays a little bit bigger than 0. So if we take minus 5 and divide it by a small but positive number, we're going to end up with negative infinity. If you try plugging in very small values of x, you'll see that this limit goes to minus infinity. One last limit. What happens to the sine of 2x over x as x goes to 0? The sine of 0 is 0, so we have 0 divided by 0 again. And again, you may want to plug some very small numbers into this function, and make sure x is in radians. Let's try plugging in some small values of x to this expression down here. Let's start with x equals 0 0.1. So we have sine of 2x, or sine of 0 0.2, divided by 0 0.1. If we plug that into our calculator using radian mode, we'll find that the answer is 1.99, which seems pretty close to 2. If we tried x equals 0 0.01, we would have gotten something even closer to 2, 1.9999, much more 9s. So it looks like this limit is approaching 2. This limit went to 2. Like infinity over infinity, a limit that looks like 0 over 0 could be anything. Whenever you see it, be very careful. And those are all the rules. A lot of the time you can split up the addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division of limits into multiple limits. But think very carefully whenever you're dealing with zero and infinity. When you get to those trouble cases, plugging in values or graphing the function can guide you toward the answer.